What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? Learn that Washington never told a lie. Learn that soldiers seldom die. Learn that everybody's free. That's what the teacher said to me. That's what I learned in school today. That's what I learned in school. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I learned that policemen are my friends. I learned that justice never ends. I learned that murderers die for their crimes, even if we make mistakes sometimes. That's what I learned in school today. That's what I learned in school. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I learned our country must be strong, it's always right and never wrong. Our leaders are the finest men, and we elect them again and again. And that's what I learned in school today, that's what I learned in school. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I learned that war is not so bad. I learned about the great ones that you have had. Fought in Germany and in France. And someday I might get my chance. And that's what I learned in school today. That's what I learned in school. <laughs> they don't teach you that no. in school. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. They don't. That was round two. This is our that second podcast we're doing here. Second. Second. It was a little bit better. <laughs> I don't think I got the key right still. That's I'm part of that. I need least. to get a capo. <laughs> forcing you into forcing you into octaves you've never sung. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, or, or, there was a great line that I heard. Uh, Sorry if I missed all your favorite notes. <laughs> no, no, just the ones I played. <laughs> But once again, that's that's true. Uh, yeah, that's 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 what music was meant for. That's right? better than anything you'll find on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, you, it is. You don't get the mistakes on YouTube. No, no, you don't. You don't. Mm. But wow. Uh, so we are starting our next our next book. If I can find it. Oh, here it is. No, um, but actually, uh, before before you yeah. even talk about that, we can we can say yeah. how that song relates to what oh, we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, no, that's important. That right? Important. There's there's a great line here. Uh, this is on page ten, uh, where Schindler says, um, "It's just this point, however, that sets into relief what is instinctive about modern skepticism. The more recent version tends not to be a result of rigorous training." Unless we would use that phrase to characterize the normal program of public education, <laughs> right? So he's he's making the distinction between the skeptic who really really tries hard to be able to sort of like question everything, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he said, "But that's not that's not what happens now. It's not a hero who's the skeptic, but right. as I wrote on the side of my page, it's not a hero but Tom, Dick, and Harry that are the skeptics. <laughs> just, right? just everyone, yeah, because because of public education. I think he even says the person on the street. Yeah, the next sentence. Yeah, it's everyday person. person on the street. Right, mm-hmm. it's a default frame of mind. Yeah, and that's what you learn in school. That's what you learn in school, right? That's what you learn in school, and that's what Pete Singer's concerned about. Yeah, right? yeah. and a lot of other things, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but amazingly, that's what we're concerned yeah, about, and a yeah. lot of other things no. sometimes. The same thing. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's concerned more just about educa- pub- public education system in general. Mm-hmm. Seems to be Schindler or Seeger. Both. Okay. <laughs> uh, seems to be. Um, I mean, if we're if we're just taking all the gloves off. Yeah. I think Seeger's worried that it becomes fascist. Yeah, and and I, I, I think Schindler might be worried about that too. Yeah, I mean, is it is it not just a um, a power arm of yeah. of of the of the authorities mm. and and of the way of life that is right mm-hmm. and what do we mean by authority like lots of traditionally we think government officials but i think we got to think differently nowadays i mean it really is the people who are making gobs of money yeah right who yeah. aren't always government officials yeah although they make gobs of money I, from the people who make gobs of money and by usually, bribing and, 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 and it's <laughs> it's it's i mean it's so it's so interesting i think if you make gobs of money it's very likely that you can become a um an, a political official, right, 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 I mean, right. And if you don't make jobs of money, it's very likely, it may be impossible, yeah. that you will become one. Yeah. Right? Didn't we have a name for that? Wasn't it called something like oligarchy? 
<laughs> but wait a second, you got to be worried about that because doesn't Aristotle say oligarchy is like the best way to go? Uh, <laughs> but he doesn't mean it this way. Yeah. He doesn't mean it by yeah, the, by terms of the money makers. Right. He means it by terms of the virtuous. Yeah. Yeah. So. But anyway, you probably want to introduce this text before we get into yeah, it. Yeah, huh? so this is Love in the Postmodern Predicament, Rediscovering the Real in Beauty, Goodness, and Truth. And the, the first of all, first thing to note, um, um, D.C. Schindler is David Schindler. He is the son of David Schindler. <laughs> D.L. Schindler. Schindler. Yeah. Um, and they both teach at the... John Paul II Institute um, in Washington, D.C., uh, and both still living. I met D.C. Schindler at um, the philosophy conference in, in um, Minnesota this past November. Um, yeah, very, very great, very interesting, great, smart man. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was you know, largely through... Um, conversations I had with him, conversations I had with other people about his work that made me think I have to teach this book yeah. because I have to read this book. Um, Interestingly, the first time I met D.C. Schindler about 20 years ago uh, was sitting around playing guitar. Oh, wow. And he was playing uh, Leonard Cohen's Suzanne. Oh. Suzanne yeah. takes you down. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> it was him, Adrian Walker, his dad, Kathy, and me. Oh, wow. <laughs> Drinking Stella Artois, oh. singing Leonard Cohen. It was oh, pretty fun. Man. It was mm. pretty fun. <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, that's really good. Um, so, uh, one thing to note about the, the, the text, and, and Schindler gets into this, and we can we can talk about this uh, here in a bit. But the transcendentals are us- usually referred to in in a, in a particular order: um, mm-hmm. um, truth, goodness, beauty. Um, sometimes beauty is not even included in the list. Uh, sometimes, and, and and we can talk about what a transcendental is. Um, but he places beauty um, first. When you look at the table of contents, you have the first chapter, which we'll we'll talk about. I'll kind of give you a run through of what this book is going to be about. But then the second, third, and fourth chapters go through uh, these three three different transcendentals. But he puts them in this reverse order, and I think this is picking up off of uh, or picking up from uh, Balthazar's uh, trilogy, uh-huh. the um, Glory of the Lord, the Theodrama, and the Theologic, which each of those fits ha- his ordering. Fits the ordering, beauty, beginning with beauty, truth. then moving to goodness, and then and then um, truth. Um, and we, we'll we'll talk about why I think he he, he has that ordering um, here, and and why it's distinctive of why why it's why it's beneficial to do that in specifically in, in postmodern world. Where there's something unique about this presentation of the transcendentals, mm-hmm. this ordering, the structuring of them. Um, part two moves into the, the role love plays, and for those that have been um, reading your Clark, hopefully all of you, you'll <laughs> you'll know love plays a, a central role in one's understanding of being. And and this is this is I think in some ways the heart of, of the book. It's gonna get kind of dense, I believe, in chapters five and six, but we've kind of warmed up the engine with Norris Clark. Mm-hmm. So this should be a carrying on of that, but but I think into much much richer waters so that the fish are going to be a lot bigger when you pull them into the boat. (laughs) Um, Goats rather than sheep. Goats, yeah. As they say, we're going to be catching goats, not sheep. (laughs) And then the the, the last chapter is this um, reflection on being in God, I think, in in conclusion with everything he said before. So uh, we can can jump jump right into the, uh, the, the introduction. Um, the preface or the introduction? Uh, is there anything in the preface you wanted to? Um. Well, I- he interestingly he says that this is this book's about basic philosophical anthropology, which which mm-hmm. kind of goes along with everything we've been doing. Yeah, and the class and the class Phil, itself. Great right. philosophy, man. Yeah, and and so I I think that the fact that he brings out from the beginning, like when you look at the title, 
and then you read the table of contents, you don't necessarily think anthropology, right? You kind of think right. metaphysics, right? Um, mm -hmm. But 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 really, his concern is anthropology, understanding who the human person is, and and I, I like how he says that this it's really just a defense of the importance of philosophy and understanding ourselves, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think that this is uh, in many ways why how you start a lot of your classes, right? You've told me before, um, what is philosophy? Why am I in this class? Yeah, why, <laughs> why am I taking this class? Yeah, I, I think that this is in many ways answering that. Yeah. Because if you're asking, because if, if you, if you, which you should, and if you don't, then you start, please ask the question of what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Schindler's answer is, well, you have to have philosophy in order to be able to answer that. Right? Yeah. You have to, you have to sort of have some sort of a, of a, of an understanding of the question that's been asked in the history of man. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's 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 right. And so, what this does is it it looks at reality by looking at man's um, involvement in reality, man's right. man's sort of place in 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 nature, in the cosmos, his contact with reality, his contact, as, he, as yeah. he kind of puts it here on the first page. Right, and and I think interestingly, although this is in some ways it's along the same lines but it's kind of similar to Heidegger's existential anal uh, analysis of, of Dasein that to, like to understand the world you kind of need to know know yourself mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and with the recognition that the way that you think about man is going to um, have effects on the way you think about reality and the way you think about reality is going to have a effect on the way you think about yourself so so there's this there's this um, and of course both of those are going to affect how you think about god yeah, yeah 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 exactly because because i think the question on the table is how should we think about being and mm -hmm. um the uh the um as we i think we may have mentioned last last time the the subject matter has to the mode by which you you answer a question has to be faithful to the subject matter mm -hmm. in question and so you need to make sure that you you are clear about what the subject matter kind of is and 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 that there's something paradoxical in in asking that because you you need to say well how do i know what the subject matter is if i don't already have a kind of a a, 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 a knowledge of how to think about it or knowledge uh -huh. right? so 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 there's something already, you know, paradoxical. Yeah. In just seemingly cyclical about yeah this yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, but he begins. He begins w where um, Aristotle begins his and metaphysics, and you too it begins with desire. Desire. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For those U two fans, that's all U two. I mean, for those Aristotle fans, you'll get your stuff too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's to each his own. <laughs> to each his own. Uh, but man, man by nature desires to know, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think what what you have is the question: Why is that the case? Why is it the case that man by nature desires to um, to know? How do we know that that's the case? And Schindler seems to suggest that it's it's partly because we take delight in in. In, in knowledge, specifically in, in sensory knowledge, mm -hmm. and, and he makes a distinction between, um, um, <coughs> like like taking pleasure and taking delight in, in it. And I think there's also, kind of on the table, um, the notion of because perception, s sensation, and 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 also knowledge, more broadly considered. Is a contact with reality. It's a mm -hmm. way of it's a way of of um, um, sort of making making yourself uh, one with with reality. And mm -hmm. there's there's something I don't want to I don't want to put it in these terms. Cause it's going to just sound too kind of utilitarian or too pragmatic. But it's something there's something comforting, something at home, something peaceful about. Um, knowing where one is, not necessarily geographically, but where one is in the cosmos, where one is right. in one's life and existence and being. And, and I think there's something 
there's something that sort of puts you in in an order which 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 gives you a type of a type of comfort but i that's going to sound really bad but i think i think that's what that's what we tend to take delight in and is that when we see things we kind of are capable of orienting ourselves mm -hmm. um, and having um, a type of knowledge so knowledge seems to be a way of contacting reality which brings about a um, there's an interesting an awareness. Uh, this point about aware, uh, ordering in the cosmos is, is, is sort of the main point of Gardini's End of the Modern World, uh -huh. where he says that the what's happened to us today after sort of scientific discoveries, and especially sort of like astrobot, or not astrological, astronomical yeah, yeah. <laughs> discoveries, um, and the fact that the Earth is just not the center of all of reality geographically, um, has, has de- derailed man's understanding of his place in the in, in the cosmos and so that he doesn't feel at home he kind of uses that yeah. language he yeah. doesn't feel at home anymore and there's something problematic about his understanding of himself in the world now yeah um if he can't see himself within the cosmic order yeah and so i think that needs to be retrieved and i, and I wonder if that's kind of what's going to be happening here yeah and i th I, th I i think there's a a, a a deep moral um existential uh, project underway here. This isn't just purely metaphysics, purely, I mean, I think it's deeply moral <coughs> because um, in many ways, I think um, the experience of <coughs> depression is sort of an experience of being somewhere that you don't feel has any anything going for it, any meaning. There's, uh -huh. there's no... Uh -huh. There, there's sort of it's, everything is just kind of empty, lost, right? Um, and I, and I think uh, that's why a lot of people. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be specifically like clinical depression, but people that are just down or overwhelmed or what have you, they 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 they, they tend to somewhat be existentially confused, and and they just kind of want to fill fill that emptiness with something. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and usually that something has, has you know, some sort of um, psychedelic effects. <laughs> it requires prescription yeah. unless you get it under the table. Right. right. And, 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 I, and I think that this, this contact with reality, um, which really uh, comes about at the highest levels through the act of contemplation that we, we talked about earlier, um, reading Plotinus and... Um, Aristotle, um, and even a bit in Clark, this, this contemplation, which is a rather, I mean, people would describe it this way who weren't professional philosophers. I think it's a fairly apt way to do it. It's, it's fairly psychedelic in the sense that it, it gives you this sort of view of, of everything mm -hmm. um, that kind of makes you see your home, right? You're, you, you, you belong, and here's how you belong and why you belong. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's what people experience they're missing but yet aren't sure how to get it they know that they know they're lacking that even if they never stated in these terms they know experientially that's what they're lacking but they don't know how to get it and the the i think the, one of the one of the great dangers of the postmodern one of the great problems of the postmodern predicament is that people have fallen into the bourgeois metaphysic mm -hmm. realizing that it gives you this emptiness it ultimately results to this emptiness because it, it, it's about isolation. And then the question is, how do I find meaning? How do I actually contact, as, as Schindler puts it, contact reality? But in virtue of that bourgeois metaphysic, it's impossible to contact reality. And so you're looking for something that you just don't have the, the, the metaphysical um, path to get. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, it's, that's, get sounds bad. To, to, you don't have the metaphysical path to see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so I think this is, this is more than just, oh, here's an interesting theory of things. Mm -hmm. this, this is really about um, are you going to live a meaningful life or are you going to live in a world of nothing? Right, and, and I think one of the keys there is a meaningful life is one that maintains its meaning from a true grounding rather than my creation of meaning right because which is the nothingness exactly because then because then when you when you recognize and this is the great the great um, 
uh, sort of duping of, of modernity is, and that when you think that you can like provide your own truths, your own identity, your, your own goodness, mm -hmm. your own beauty to things, what you've done is you've already made by that, that proclamation, you've made a limit. You've set a limit or a parameter to what could be good, to what can be beautiful or what can be true. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore you've, you've ripped anything like, um, surprise or depth or um, mm, um, transcendence out, yeah. out of it and so it becomes stale right so yeah so you know it's kind of like the person who wants to write a song because they think it's really important to write songs <laughs> but yet they don't have anything really important to say yeah and and so they they, they just you know caricature um, Woody Guthrie yeah. and Bob Dylan <laughs> Yeah. And you too. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they take some of the, their favorite artists and they, they come up with this song. And it's really stale and it's really boring because it's just a repeat. And they can't, they, they're like, I want to be original. But how can I be original? And I think what you're, what you're doing is you're, you're trying to impose a song on reality. And anyone yeah. that's a real artist, anyone that's ever really done something, whether it's, it can be a work of philosophy, it could be, uh, you know, writing a piece of philosophy, writing a piece of theology, writing a piece of any sort of like academic work that's like not just for the sake of like a publication. It could be like a piece of music or a poem. I think you see you're not really the creator of this in, in a sense. I, I, I think that's for many people, something is is pulling you towards this right um, right i don't set the parameters on what is going to be revealed here so to speak right. um i'm sort of the instrument i'm right. the pen but there's someone speaking through me it's um, like it, it's like the uh, the ancient sort of uh oracles and how they would kind yeah. of be like subsumed by something yeah. else right and then they would be able to do something yeah or say something meaningful yeah. uh there's a great book uh that's that i um that I, I, I read and I had to write a review for. It. I think it was called. I think it was just called the gift. I, I gosh, I don't even remember what it was about. But it, it was this exploration of different cultures and their understanding of and their like foundation on giftedness. Hmm. And it had a lot to do with that. And the second half was all on these poets, hmm. um, and and the understanding that gifts that 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 reality or like meaningfulness comes unexpected unsought for as a, as as sort of a burden that's placed upon yeah. the artist yeah um so that they have to express something that they didn't come up with and this something that came to yeah them. yeah and th and then there's a there's there's a sort there's a calling this is why artists typically see what they're doing as like a vocation and and there's there's therefore a demand in some ways and that many of them while they're writing songs or while they're 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 painting or while they're 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 writing you know a, a, a piece of philosophy or theology or what have you I, I for for a lot of these people it it's unsettling it's kind of right you can't sleep you can't yeah. you can't um because there's something that that's trying to come to light um and and you sort of recognize that you have some sort of contact in 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 a non goofy sense of yeah. like like you know yeah. we're contacting the alien spirits right. and, and right but um, but not but not completely divorced from that not, mean, but not right like, it really is seems to be something foreign yeah oh no de yeah definitely and those yeah. that have had those experiences um and this i mean this could also happen just in in prayerful meditation that, yeah that, that these these thoughts these these um experiences are not sort of originating from me whereas i think the the um the, the bourgeois metaphysics or as he puts it the technological um uh um way this is on page two page two uh -huh. about halfway or so um the ideal perhaps aimed at asymptomatically that is in, in modern culture the ideal um is a virtual reality because before he says what the goal of modern culture is to actually protect us from reality it's to right. construct our own reality we don't like what's happening and therefore we want to try to have our own paths our own avenue by which we travel and live our lives so that we don't actually have to be in the world 
Of um, course, of course, drugs fit right into. And that. drugs fit exactly yeah. right, right in there, right. Yeah. But it, but it could also it could also be other, I mean, drugs, but but other just ideologies right. that we we don't like the way or we don't want this to be the 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 way we treat people, and so we're going to you know construct some sort of political mm -hmm. system that you know puts those people and marginalizes them and gets people more or less thinking along the same lines mm -hmm. just through the way that we treat them. So so the 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 ideal aim that is a virtual reality having the sensation without any contact with the real at all. So you want a sort of sensation of the real without it actually being a real genuine experience of it. Um I think this is this is definitely something that um is, is prevalent in pornography. Uh -huh. uh, you have the the all of the the sort of the sensation without any of the the real cost mm -hmm. or the real um, um, experience or, or the or real the, full stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The real experience. Right, um, and and but but he goes on to say that um, this is usually done for the sake of of, of like an enhancement. Um, and he goes on, but technology, in fact, always sets the terms for our encounter. Mm -hmm. And so, in subtle but profound ways, determines what we can experience. Mm -hmm. It gives our experiences a particular shape and character. Our experiences are thus largely pre-planned affairs, moderated in a manner that gives us some control over possible consequences. Uh, so you have this... Um, this design of how you're going to contact or how you're going to know or engage with reality such that you can be guaranteed of the outcome mm -hmm. or the degree to which you can be guaranteed of the outcome is the degree to which that's a better way of, mm -hmm. of being. And so technology is this power that leads you to um, like be able to manage the consequences and therefore to like construct how reality will speak to you and how you will speak to and engage with reality mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so what you're what you're doing in, in doing that is you're cutting off any unexpected unplanned for um, um, showings manifestations of reality uh -huh. and and therefore you're, you're you're actually cutting yourself off from the the true the good and the beautiful because that as, as we're gonna see um, the true, the good, and the beautiful are things that you you can't plan for, right. uh, and they're they're the things which you can't um, claim to, to to know to, to have this but, like completed and grasp of. He seems to be saying that when you when you isolate these experiences and pre-plan them and s sort of try to set the terms of the encounter so that it never has adverse effects. He's saying by that very fact, you buffer yourself from the reality itself yeah. so that you don't actually experience reality. I mean, as, you, as you've been talking, the thing that popped into my head was zoos, which seems like a, a very technological kind yeah. of thing, right? At first I, I thought you said Zeus. No, not Zeus. <laughs> Zeus. Z-O-O-S. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to encounter a tiger, mm -hmm. but I'm not really going to encounter a tiger. I'm only going to encounter a tiger behind very closed areas pits that he can't get out of um most likely he his his tiger nature is amazingly like diminished because yeah. he just eats stuff that's given to yeah. him he sits around yeah. what sh what should a tiger 12 feet from a human being do what would what would a tiger in reality right. a real tiger right <laughs> right and 12 feet from reality what would it do right right well, and what would you do? It twelve would, feet from a tiger? It would devour you, right? And, and you, you would, would run, and you would have no business being twelve feet from a tiger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there's something very technological about the zoo, I think. It, well, I, I think there's. I I don't want to like be a hater of of, of, of zoos, but <laughs> but I think I think at the very least to recognize that you're not actually seeing a real the tiger in it in its fullness and its right. in its full right. reality, its full nature, and I think what we tend right. to think we can do is we can we can orchestrate an experience of, a, of an animal say and therefore we can we can have an understanding of that animal properly um in a true experience in a, tr in a, in a true sort yeah. of experiential way but by by that mere fact of of putting it in the situation and, and orchestrating it in this such such a way um 
we've we've made it not genuine, not real. Right. It's 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 very similar to the. Someone's going to know this. This is why it's better to teach live. But those those physics experiments, um, where the observer actually has an effect on the outcome, right? Um, of, of of the of, of the experiment, uh -huh. so that to observe the experiment is to play a role in what the outcome actually is. Right. And and you can only use those experiments as genuine data when you take into account that the mere observation, what, you, what you're experiencing isn't like the, the particle or the quark in its pure nature and therefore we really know what it's doing. No, 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 what you're observing is the the quark as observed as by me being observed and yeah. under these under these conditions <laughs> and these I think observa ob observation which are in, in in a real sense causal yeah yeah and I think the exact same thing happens with watching tigers in zoos you say oh here's a tiger this look guys this is what a tiger really is <laughs> um, and and I think there's a, a sense in which you are looking at a tiger but only under these these conditions so what you're seeing is actually a tiger confined in such a way that it actually can't really do what tigers do when they're not confined. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, guys, look, here's a quark. Everyone watch what the quark does. <laughs> no, what you're looking at is a quark that's doing what quarks do when you're watching it. Right. Which is different from what they do when you're not watching it. it can I pause for a great story? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so in an attempt to, to, to sort of um, overcome some aspect of the buffering and, 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 and sort of the uh, – the materialism of our culture as a family we've been trying to sort of like cut back on corks not corks <laughs> no and not tigers um but on uh on on just like the glut of christmas presents right? yeah which yeah, which yeah. which are about consumption uh -huh. and not about you know love yeah uh -huh, um, uh -huh. and so um in an attempt to do this i convinced my extended family to uh instead of paying a lot of money for a bunch of junk that nobody really cares about Let's have an experience together. Let's spend money on having a real experience yeah. together. So we went to the Great Wolf Lodge, which is the antithesis of a real experience. <laughs> and they have this, and I don't know if this is true at all of the Great Wolf. The, the one in Kansas City had this. I assume that all of them have it. They have this big nature display. It's supposed to be like you're going to the outdoors, and it's the complete simulacra of the uh, outdoors. Yeah. I mean, it is disgusting. And they have this, like, story time where these, these, these like, Chuck E. Cheese-esque Okay. Puppets come yeah. out, uh -huh. and, and they start singing the song about how there's nothing to fear in the woods. And there's this giant bear singing the song, and then there's this little Indian girl princess that's there, and then there's squirrels and, and raccoons, and, and, and everybody's living in harmony. And I, was, I remember watching this and being appalled and thinking, <laughs> this is the greatest lie of all time. Of course there's stuff to fear in the woods. This is why we're at the Great Wolf Lodge. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, this is why we're not in the woods. <laughs> right. But it, but it made me think that I, I, I have walked from, from one buffer zone to another. Yeah. And so in trying to save sort yeah. of the material consumption, I walked into this complete simulacra of reality. And I'm still buffered from reality. And I'm still – it's a technological yeah. solution to a technological yeah. problem. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. I, it wasn't a real experience. Yeah. And it was um, – I never, I never want to go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was like it was like the zoo times t times yeah, ten. You know? Yeah, it was it was terrible. Uh, it was terrible. If, if if you ever have a chance to experience this, I suggest you don't. Okay. <laughs> it's that unless bad. you're a sociologist, <laughs> <laughs> which kind of I feel like we are sometimes. Yeah, I know. I know. Unless you unless you're studying anthropology. Uh, I just you know, I just need to learn how to retrieve data. <laughs> that would be great. But there's but the, the the interesting thing on page three where he kind of explains this is he says he says uh, at the top of that first paragraph, if all men by nature desire to know, mm -hmm. however, then this project is radically anti-human. The purpose of the present book in the face of this project, which we are increasingly taking for granted as something altogether normal, is to recall a pre-modern vision of man as ordered to communion with reality. And in the page before, he said encountering reality is a basic part of the meaning of human existence. Right. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sensory things. Yeah, and I we think, wouldn't be animals. And, and I think even the modern technological culture speaks to that fact because what what it's trying to do is it's trying to give you right that that experience. The most important thing to be human is to have those experiences, the contact with reality, but only under safe, as he as he puts it. Um, um, uh, the 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 the, the pre-planned affair right. sort of way, such that there is no risk involved in contacting reality. 
Um, so, so I think even the, the even the modern, you know, metaphysical um, project right. recognizes that it, the human thing is to have these experiences. It just thinks reality itself is not integral to those experiences. Right. It, the it experience thinks... is different from what is being experienced. Right. And it, and it, and it thinks that you can package these experiences in cellophane yeah. and put them on shelves. So there's this there's this philosopher, political philosopher, um, uh, Nozick. Robert Nozick? Uh, shoot, I can't believe I forgot that. I think, um, I think it's Robert Nozick. But anyway, he, he came up with this idea uh, called the um, – experience machine there's this sort of thought project <laughs> kind of goofy but but it, it actually serves an interesting point he yeah. says suppose suppose you had this 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 machine that could give you all the experiences that you wanted to have experience um you wanted to go to Bennington college and get <laughs> get a degree in philosophy and high five high five uh president menace and rocky the raven, and rocky the raven. <laughs> maybe we should get him on zoom at least <laughs> That'd be great. Um, uh, so, so you 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 can plan. You know, you get your checklist, plan all the things you want to occur throughout your your life. Um, would you would you do it? You can you can plan it all out, and then you could say one of the checks, one of the boxes you could check is, I don't know that I'm in a machine that's fake, that's uh-huh. giving me a fake reality, uh-huh. right? So suppose like yeah, you know, it'd be really lame to be in this world knowing. This is all great and cool, but this is all fake because I can, I orchestrated all this. And yeah. say, no, no, no. The best thing to do would be to orchestrate it all and then have part of your orchestration, part of your ordering, the forgetfulness right. that this is orchestrated. Right, right. right. Okay, so, so add that in. That's a box you can check. Okay, And then you'd say, okay, would you want it? Some people – so I used to teach this article back when I would TA at University of Nebraska. And some people would say, no, 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 I wouldn't enter the machine because – there's something really valuable about like struggling to attain your goals and, and you, you don't get that if you get this paper. I said, who says, man, the best lives are the ones that you have to like do a little bit of struggling for. And so you could like add it into yeah. your, your paperwork. Yeah. yeah. Here's check that box. Man, turn, you struggle box. You didn't even look, you didn't even look on section four, which was called the struggle section. <laughs> what struggles do you want to suffer or right. to undergo? Right. And you can check struggle this and this and this and yeah. this. Yeah. I want kind of a good family, but not the best family because, because I want to like be able to have something to overcome, but yeah, yeah. it's also like help and, and be thankful for and yada And you, you fill it all out. Fill you whatever can fill you all that out. out. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you could say, you know, I'm not sure if I want this, this or this. I'll maybe check. You know, two of these, and you know, just kind of make it random between these two or three. And yeah, we'll, right. Um, would you do it? Right? Would you do it? You can kind of more or less orchestrate how it all went. And some people, uh, actually, most people, when I would teach this, would say it doesn't matter. Like, like whether you choose to do that or you, you don't. I mean, like, you wouldn't know the difference. It's not that big of a deal. Like, of course, why wouldn't you do this? Um, and and I think a lot of people found it hard to conceive why there would be anything going for reality huh. um, un- under this condition. Like, that's like, dreadful. Yeah. Because what, what – I mean, you don't know it. You don't know that this is not real. Right. Um, and it might be that, like, suppose, suppose you have reality playing itself out and then you have yourself orchestrating reality – and it just turns out that those maybe on the surface are exactly the same, um, such that the life as it would naturally, normally, genuinely be lived and the one that you orchestrated in the experience machine are identical. Yeah. You might say, well, well then it doesn't matter at all because yeah. they're exactly the same on the surface. But I think uh, what Schindler's going to say is, no, there's a, there's, there is an infinite difference between the two because what matters isn't the surface. What matters is... What is what is it that's speaking, communicating through these experiences? And on mm-hmm. the one, it's truth, goodness, and beauty. On the other, it's you, yeah, and Doctor Strangelove, <laughs> <laughs> or, or whoever, whatever, whatever smart scientist, or the is, Matrix, or the Matrix, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so you have you have the um, the the I think the the, the difference in these two metaphysics isn't at the surface level it's at the right it's at the sort of the, the foundation the depths 
And the one allows for truth, goodness, and beauty. And the other says, no, there is no such thing. There's uh-huh. only the, quote, experience of truth, goodness, and beauty uh-huh. that matters. Um, and, and seeing what the difference is, is, is actually, I think, in some ways, the whole point of chapter one. Yeah, it, I was going to say, it, it, that seems like a rejection of beauty, where you yeah. say the thing is the thing itself and not anything beyond the thing itself. Right. And if, it, if there's nothing beyond the thing itself, then that's what, the, that's what beauty is. So the real seems to be a true communication of something beyond itself. And therefore, to love the real is, and this is kind of what he gets at at the bottom of page three, right? yeah. to love the real, that which, that, that which has genuine ontological depth is, is, it can only be loved if it's sort of this, 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 this thing that's beautiful, that's beyond itself, right? Going back to sort of Plotinus' understanding yeah. of beauty. Yeah. Yeah. And so then the, the next sentence uh, there, the book begins and ends with an uh, apologia. <laughs> uh, some, some places he puts the Greek, but um, for philosophy. So this is an apology for philosophy uh, interpreted here precisely as an all encompassing love of the real, a love that is only deepened by Christian faith. Mm-hmm. So, so what this book is about is about ultimately what it means to be human mm-hmm. and what it means to be human is to love the real. And so the question is, what is the real? What is reality? Mm -hmm. And if you're not concerned about what is reality, then you're not concerned about what it means to be human. Yeah, you're you're not not being human. And you're not human. Yeah, Um, you're not being human because as he he puts it before, encountering reality is a basic part of the meaning of human existence. The reason that we take delight in knowing things sensorily is because man is meant to know. Yeah. Man is meant to know reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so interestingly, he actually says, those who regulate society in such a way that there's no threats to common culture, bottom of page five, uh, the, the, they are the barbarians. Yeah. They are not the ones who, who, who threaten common culture, but they are the purveyors of common culture, which means that when we look at the world and we ask, where are the barbarians? We think it's the ones like crazy people like, like, like Dr. Jager, who's trying to like make you question the technological paradigm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not the barbarian. And yeah. the barbarians are the ones with, uh, as, as C.S. Lewis once put it, uh, who have clean fingernails. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. He said, he said, they're not going to be evil demons that are, that are trying to destroy the world. They're going to be the ones that try to keep you buying their products and thinking that they can give you the world um, for uh, or easy payments of nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> and free shipping and handling, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I think this is the, the hmm. fact that the barbarians are the purveyors of common culture is a new thing. That's why. Yeah. That's yeah. why we we are in a new situation and why it requires. And of course, I'm going to say this: a new evangelization. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh man, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Let's move. Let's move into chapter one. Okay. Uh, I mean, we can. Uh, the more that I'm realizing, I'm like, oh, these are short readings, but. But there's uh, they're packed, they're packed. They're absolutely packed. packed. I mean, we've got we haven't even gotten to t- double digits yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so chapter one, philosophy, the transcendentals, and reality. So this is only going to cover a few important topics. Just the impossible grass in our bourgeois metaphysics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the impossible grass. Be- this is beautiful. Uh, that um, as, as he quotes G.K. Chesterton on, on page nine there. Um, we shall, uh, I'll just sit. Fire, I'll read the quote. Fires yeah, yeah. will be kindled and to testify that two and two make four. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. We shall be left defending not only the incredible virtues and sanities of human life, but something more incredible still. This huge impossible universe which stares us in the face. We shall fight for visible prodigies. As if they were invisible, we shall look on the impossible grass and the skies with a strange courage. We shall be of those who have seen and yet have believed. <laughs> I mean, Your sight coming back into play. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. And, it, and this incredible um, paradox that, of course, of course, what you see, what you, what you have known ever since childhood um of course the things you take to be most fundamental to to 
your understanding of the world. Of course that has to be wrong. That seems to be this presupposition that that is sort of in play, in, in, as you called it, in, in modern skepticism. Uh -huh. That you, you have this you have this training, as we sort of made reference to at the very beginning, in virtue of living in the modern world, that there is a hermeneutics of suspicion. There's always something more uh, uh, um, sort of, um, so there's always something further down in your psychological basement that's the real reason for why mm -hmm. you're acting friendly towards your neighbor or you're acting charitable towards your wife or you're playing catch with your son or can whatever. I, uh, you know. can, can, I, can I throw something out here yeah. that's, that's kind of a wrench in our own plans? Yeah. Aren't we kind of saying that, though? Aren't we kind of saying, like, you think these things, but there's something you have to – you have to. I mean, what, what I'm trying to say is yeah. – you have to be a skeptic of the modern paradigm of reality. Yeah. And you have to see it as, it, it, and, and as Schindler puts it, the pre-modern understanding. Yeah. Of, I mean, aren't we, in a sense, playing on that skepticism? Yeah. And yeah. so even though I'm trying to say this skepticism is bad, I, I kind of rely on some skepticism against the skeptical mindset itself. Yeah. And it, good. Yeah. And I think, I, think what's, I think what's in play is – the um, you have these two these two opposed metaphysics, and they both say there's something you shouldn't be skeptical of. There's something that because I think what what he's saying is the bourgeois metaphysics is one that actually takes there to be some sort of absolute grounding, uh -huh. and that absolute grounding is as he puts it on fifteen. It's the um, yeah. Yeah. it's the the individualism it's self-interest self-interest is the right. basic reference point for meaning the primary principle of social organization right and so so i think what what he's i think what he's trying to do is he's saying um you kind of have to be skeptical in in a in a in a um in an inquisitive way maybe in a socratic way that okay. that, that that helps you to uncover what the roots of reality are so it's not a skepticism that's cynical about a true ground that that is that is good R right because that because the, the modern skeptic is always going to say i know why you really did this it's for yourself right? yeah and because yeah. that's why i do things yeah and yeah. therefore you're another and, me and everyone and, and the real reason we have freedom is so that we can just do whatever we want to do in life and right. maybe what you want to do in life is be kind and love people and say the other's will and the other's good is greater than my good. And, and yeah. that's your choice. And go for it. Yeah, that's – man, see, we, we are living in the best pluralistic society because you can have your ends and I can have my ends. Right. And I think what he's saying is that's not – there's no such thing really as a pluralistic society, mm -hmm. it seems. He seems to be saying mm -hmm. to, to, live, to, live, to live freedom in terms of communism – I mean, we're going political here. To live, to, to say, the communists could say, oh, yeah, no, you can, you can express yourself. Um, you just kind of have to do it within this system. Yeah. Um, I think it's to, to not actually be... To not be free. A free, a free yeah. expression, right? Yeah. To say, oh, you can be a Christian, but you also have to do so in light of this, this broader picture that other people, other people aren't. And they and, right. and 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 you know it's just that's just this is just my view what I do on Sundays and this person's going to do whatever they want to do on Sundays. Right. Um, I think what he's saying is that that is not a world in which there could be Christians, nor could there be truth or goodness or. So or the Christian, peace. the Christian in the quote unquote pluralistic society is not really a Christian, but is actually grounded in this self-interest thing right um and yeah. that, that we're all we're all just self-interest Christ, christians are only christians because of a unique type of self-interest they right have. because that's what flows their boat yeah yeah because yeah. that's that's what's going to make you happy yeah um yeah. Or, or that's what's that's what seems most real to you or you know. so so he kind of is almost I, I didn't think about it this way when he was writing this but now i see it rejecting pluralism Qua pluralism as being a possibility. I don't know if he says that, but yeah. that that's the implication. That's where we're going with That's this. the implication. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe it entails that, perhaps. Um, Which I uh, have 
I've asked this question many times. I mean, he seems to suggest it in terms – just as there can't be – it's not like a pluralism about truth allows there to be particular – like a multitude of particular truths. It actually is one in which there's only one truth, and that's this like radical – right. This like radical relativism, which maybe is sort of incoherent in light of this other understanding – yeah, of what truth. But but I think the concern is that 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 becomes a way of life. Yeah, right. The way of life is living in this pluralistic slash not really pluralistic, but everything is relative. Yeah. In such a way that even my own Christianity is relativistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and so then it so then it's not real. It, you can't have real. Just as you could say, oh, the the what? How, how did you put it earlier? Maybe it was the other podcast or something about like. That's my – being with you is what makes me most happy. <laughs> no, uh, it's that terrible song. Uh, I like me better when I'm with you. Yeah. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know that terrible song. Maybe, so. maybe we should end, end the podcast okay. with that song. Okay. Bring that one up. Okay. So, <laughs> but, but I think it's that, um, that idea that, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm loving and I'm good and I give gifts to people and all that because that's what makes me – that's how I find my life m- – most like meaningful that's most. how i i think i think i think what he would want to say is that's how i would say that's how i put meaning into my life right? yeah yeah and so the ground of it is this this, this i'm putting meaning into my life yeah um but uh it's yeah. it's uh, i i think it's it's a very um it is it is within itself Within that same metaphysic, you know, I love this this line that he has from Chesterton again. Every every this is a eleven. Every man in the street must hold a metaphysical system and hold it firmly. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you this this made me think of. I mean, maybe we should end it with this song uh, that we can't stop doing metaphysics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. because that's the that's that that song uh, by the twenty uh, first century monads. Twenty first century monads. <laughs> That uh, that we can't stop doing metaphysics. It's because uh, it's because everybody automatically has a metaphysics, right? No matter what, you have a metaphysic. Yeah. And and so the the question is though, do we have a mindless one? Do we have one that comes up, that that that, that comes about on account of the, the the way? I mean, maybe not mindless. I mean, it, 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 I mean, we all take our metaphysics from that around us. But the, the question that we have here is, are we taking our metaphysics from a problematic metaphysical system of technology? Yeah. Right? And, and I think that that's the concern that he has. Um, but, of course, he, he has this very interesting line, ex- explanation where he says – and this is the whole point of the, that quote from Chesterton at the beginning. Um, we can't think that there's a quarrel between ancient and modern metaphysics. He said it's like trying to compare American and British football teams, right? Yeah. Basically, a football team and a soccer team is what he's really talking about. Yeah. Which is the better team? He's like, that's that's a nonsensical question. They, they they don't even play by the same rules, right? And he says that's what's happening here, right? So at mm-hmm. the top of mm-hmm. twelve, he says, uh, with the moderns, a metaphysics has been challenged by a non-metaphysic, it, and, and maybe he said maybe not challenged, but simply supplanted. The ground has been taken out from under it, so that it is left in a sense floating in the air. And in this respect, it has been effectively neutralized, and so there uh, ceases I, to be any need to challenge it. I think I, I think I get what's going on. Like, like I, I, so when you take the bourgeois metaphysic, and you say, okay, everyone kind of gets their own say, their, as he puts it, their right to privacy of, yeah. of their like intellectual volitional privacy. Right. Um, they can do with with their lives and their intellect and their will what they want. Um, Private, self-contained, un unimposing truth right and so then yeah. so then what you do is you say okay what's what's better the the the, the bourgeois metaphysic or the classical aristotelian thomistic platonic platinian i mean whatever you fill, yeah. in, fill in whatever you want yeah and 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 that's a view that says there's only one good there's only one true right here's the path to virtue um that's the the path to the path and, to and the good. assumption here is that that breeds violence too. Yeah, yeah, and and the reason the, I think I think what's going on is like the reason that's going to be seen as as inferior because it's being evaluated from within right. the bourgeois with with the backdrop of the bourgeois metaphysic. Right. So of course, when you see, okay, we have this alternative: either you go with this pluralism, or you go with this authoritarianism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, within the bourgeois metaphysic, of course, you should reject the authoritarian um, as as you know bigotry. 
because it's contrary to quote unquote freedom. Yeah, that we yeah. have in the pluralistic. Right, and so so really what what you're what you're what you're doing is you're trying to evaluate which of these is a better way to think about the world with already having a prior way of thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so mm -hmm. it's kind of like, how do you argue about the most fundamental way of thinking about the world? You can't do that in anything like a standard argumentative way because that's exactly right. to presuppose an, a, 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 a neutral way of, of thinking about the world. This is why there is no such thing as like a neutral political sphere in which you can like argue out you know what should we do legally right let's, let's, let's leave all of our religious and metaphysical opinions aside and let's all come together and yeah because guess what you've just entered into a metaphysics yeah yeah which is which is the modern bourgeois metaphysics exactly exactly but, and, and it's interesting that it has to do with rights yeah no i i, I think know? that's at the heart of it actually in many ways the idea of rights assumes this this privacy right which he interestingly says is is a, a completely new reality privacy as being something that we need to fight for he's like N nobody thought of this before this is this is new um and yet this privacy is this weird i mean there's this is fascinating understanding that i, I mean i don't know what you want to get into if you're yeah. if i'm no, taking no, over here yeah, do it. but on page 14 right he quotes piggy so of course yeah. i'm going to read that yeah, right yeah. <laughs> but he's He's talking about the fact that this paragraph is, is, is beautifully written because it really explains a lot to me, even about myself, right? The point seems to be, this is the, it, it, why might this neutralizing of truth claims be desirable? The point seems to be, above all, not to deny any particular truth claim outright in the sense of taking a definitive position on it, but just the opposite, to avoid taking an inflexible stand on one side of the question or the other. Right. Um, so uh, we want to allow a particular claim to be true, but only as far as it goes, and as long as it does not exclude the possibility of someone else taking a different view. So we, we believe mm -hmm. these things, supposedly, um, but only insofar as I don't make you believe them. And, and he specifically says the common, the common nature, the communal nature of truth is destroyed in this. And not only that. Even the thing that I hold to believe isn't true, right? Here's the big E quote, right? Yeah. To be modern means not to believe what one believes, yeah. right? Because I can't really believe it. If I really believe it, then I think it's a communal reality that we should all understand this. Yeah. And instead, it's, no, I just believe this, uh, but you don't have to believe that. That means I really don't believe that. Right? Yeah, right, 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 right. Which is fascinating, I think. Yeah. Um, to be modern is not to believe what one believes. And, and, and that's why I think your point about Christianity is true. Because if you live Christianity in a pluralistic way, you don't believe Christianity. Right. And now that doesn't mean, like, okay, then you to be a Christian, you have to then go kill all non-Christians. Or, or, <laughs> or that you have to go, um, you know, start an apologetic YouTube channel yeah. where you try to convince everybody yeah. about Christianity. Yeah. Or, yeah. or that there should be um, – I mean, this is an interesting question that we kind of got into. Or that there should be a um, – um, a, 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 a theocracy, yeah, right. Like, I mean, so one, an interesting question is: Is Christianity a political? How does Christianity manifest as a, as a social communal reality? Yeah, I don't know if, if it if it comes from the top down. Yeah, right. Yeah. So so yeah. so the, the the power of Christianity is in its it's in its weakness. It's in its sort of sacrificial gift of oneself to another uh -huh. that's the law uh -huh. of 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 christ and so that i think i think to to think that oh to be a christian we need to like mandate that everyone does this um is is typically what a lot of christians might think right um and what a lot of people think about christians <clears throat> yeah but but i think that's still to be within the bourgeois metaphysics yeah, it's I just think so. to, it's just to say that you um, you need to there's only one self-interest in mind and that's the one that I have mm -hmm. I have the right self-interested mm -hmm. view of, of truth of goodness of reality Right. where I think interestingly the, the Christian is the person that says no I'm not the true the good and the beautiful like the, the, the true the good and beautiful go read the life of Moses and you'll see <laughs> we have no idea what that is yeah yeah um, but it has to do with reality and it's another yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think maybe another way to think of it is the bourgeois metaphysics is the metaphysics of pride, whether that's 
each individual, I can, I, I have the, like the power and I have to decide for myself what is true, good and beautiful. And so it's sort of a individual prideful metaphysic, or it's a, it's a communal prideful metaphysic, like sort of deviations of, you know, Christianity that says, you know, this has to be imposed on everyone because this is the true, like, self-interest this is how you're really going to make it in the world right right it's 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 not to live according to the atheistic paradigm but it's to live according to to this and and that's how you're really going to be someone right great uh and i think it's it's still out of a self-interest right um it's just they're saying there's only one self-interest that really matters right and that's not love right, right. so the alternative would be the, the classical metaphysics which i think would be a metaphysics of humility which I think flowers ultimately into a metaphysics of love. So maybe, yeah. maybe that's kind of how this is going to play out. Yeah. So it's it's going to be specifically against self interest, right? So uh, page fifteen is where he does this definition of the bourgeois. Let's call this bourgeois metaphysics, which I was cheering when I read yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because if you don't, if you know anything about his father, uh, David D. C. Schindler's father, he has a whole take on bourgeois. Uh, is is America bourgeois? Yeah. Actually, specifically. Um, a debate that he had with George Weigel in the 80s, which is mm -hmm. a fascinating read. Um, but he says, bourgeois is an adjective meant to describe any form of existence, pattern of life, that's important, yeah, yeah. set of values and so forth that is founded on the principle of self-interest, which is positive as most basic. Um, in the back of this, I, I can't imagine that he doesn't have de Tocqueville, Alexis yeah, de Tocqueville, yeah, yeah. who talks about self-interest as being sort of the heart of America. And he actually has some really worrisome things to say about it, but also some positive things to say about it. I, I wonder what Schindler's going to do and if he's going to take a more worrisome line on this. Because I think this is very worrisome to me because I think, I mean, going back to what he says earlier, um, this dreadful comment that he makes in the prologue that um, maybe I quoted this already. Um, yeah, I did. It's on page three. If all men by nature desire to know, however, this project, the project of sort of what what uh, the project, the energies of the modern world, the paragraph above that, the largely devoted keeping reality at bay, monitoring any encounter with what is genuinely other than ourselves and protecting us from possible consequences intended or otherwise, this project, he says, is radically anti-human. Yeah. And I think if it's in some sense centered in this principle of self-interest, then the bourgeois metaphysics and the bourgeois uh, – way of life, pattern of life is profoundly anti-human. Yeah. Right? And, and because self-interest is the opposite of love, right? Yeah. It's the opposite of love, which is, which is other interest. And, and maybe why a bourgeois Christianity w is the worst of all, right? Because it takes, it takes, it takes the, it takes Christianity, which seems to be the exact opposite of, mm -hmm. of, of the bourgeois metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And it takes it and it tries to subsume it into self-interest. It's basically to, to take to take self-interested, self disinterested love. I mean, not really disinterested. It's other interested um, love. Yeah. And to say, I'm going to use that for my yeah. own. Yeah. I mean, this gain. is this is. I'm going to quote Gregory from the life of Moses here, if you don't mind. It's kind of like being friends with Jesus, so you can sell him for thirty coins. <laughs> 30 silver pieces, right? <laughs> or as Nissa says, right, um, that we do good, this would be to do good because we hope for rewards as if cashing in on yeah. the virtuous life by some business life and business like and contractual arrangement. Yeah. Um, D.L. Schindler's article, more recent article uh, on ordinary people's lives where he goes and he writes a, a pretty strong tirade against uh, Francesca Murphy from Notre Dame yeah. on this. Because she tries to say that no self interest actually is 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 it, it, it helps to 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 bring about Christian Christian aims, and he and he basically says absolutely not, and, and it's well worth the read. It's mm -hmm. a, of course it's a D.L. Schindler article, so it's going to be long as heck. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it, I think it gets right to the heart of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to end with this quote. Uh, we're, we're pushing over a little bit, but this is on page fifteen. Okay. I think it sort of captures the bourgeois metaphysics, and it's going to open up into the next section. For next time on the transcendentals, the beauty, the good, and the true. Um, to speak of, and this is sort of the exact opposite of what the transcendentals are. Yeah. And in light of Plotinus and his understanding of good, this should all hopefully make sense. But this is the opposite of what a transcendental 
Pump is. To speak of a bourgeois metaphysics is to observe that such an interest, such forms, patterns, and values are themselves an expression of an underlying vision of the nature of reality, namely, a view that absolutizes individuals, that holds that things mean only themselves. So if you think that self-interest is the fundamental way of life, then when you look at everything else, you're going to think they only mean themselves because I only mean myself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're basically atomizing everything, isolating Th everything. This is, I think, this is already fundamentally nihilism. Yeah, yeah. This is this is this is going to become, I think, uh, uh, nihilistic. It does not recognize things as belonging in some essential manner to something greater, as being members of some encompassing whole, and thus pointing beyond themselves in their being to what is other, but instead considers them first and foremost discrete realities. This, I mean, this I mean, Norris Clark would be, I mean, he would be abhorred by the bourgeois metaphysic uh, uh, because I think it's the exact opposite of everything he was saying about what being is. Being is communal. And you don't understand being unless you understand it in terms of the self-communication to another and the receptivity. And the bourgeois metaphysics says no. Right. 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 And, and and the fact that it's 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 not it's not a fight. He says this is not a fight. It's a neutralization. Yeah. So the bourgeois metaphysics doesn't say your metaphysics is wrong. It says metaphysics is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. And, and 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 but he interestingly says this tolerance, which he calls the multiplication of egoism, the multiplication of self interest. Yeah. I tolerate you because you're interested in yourself just like I'm interested in myself. Yeah. He says this is the antithesis of love, right? Yeah. But the violence he says violence comes about just at the point of neutralization. So, or just at the yeah. point of neutralization, at the point where we say we tolerate each other becomes the point where violence appears. Yeah. Which is a very interesting thing to say because if we think of the 20th century as the most violent century in the history of humanity as we know it, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. it, it comes forth from the bourgeois metaphysics. Yeah. yeah. And that can manifest itself in, in a multitude of different political situations read right. Vaclav Havel if you're yep. interested yep 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 what the west is the east the west is the east the communist east yeah is the capitalist west capitalist west yeah and the capitalist west is the communist east yeah yeah all right on that note don't stop <laughs> <laughs>